Order. Um, good afternoon. We're now in public session, and I would like to welcome members to today's meeting of the Public Accounts Committee. Members' mobile phones must be set to airplay mode or turned off. It's not sufficient to put mobiles on silent mode as they continue to interfere with the Assembly recording. The session is recorded uh, in video and audio and can be accessed via online streaming either on Assembly website or Democracy Live. Agenda item one is apologies. Have we any apologies today? None. Agenda item two then is the minutes of the 15th of April 2021. There are pages 6 to 22 of your pack. Uh, and have members read them and believe them to be accurate and are content with them? Agreed? Agreed. Your permission to sign them. Okay. Uh, agenda item three then is declaration of interests. Members at each meeting, members are required to register relevant financial or other interests and register of members' interests. Does any member have any interest they wish to declare this afternoon? Okay. Um, agenda item four are matters arising. I have none. Uh, so we move on to agenda item five. It is correspondence, pages 26 to 54 of your pack. Um, uh, Mr. Cairn Donnelly. <coughs> Excuse me, the Controller and Auditor General, Thomas Wilkinson, uh, Director, and Mr. Kyle Bingham, um, the uh, Assembly Support Officer, have joined the meeting. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen, and welcome. Members are referred to correspondence dated the 9th of April uh, 2021, pages 26 to 33 of your pack, from Mr. Trevor McKee regarding CCNI minutes of the Special Board meeting number 87, held on the 18th of January 2021. Uh, Mr. McKee has asked that these minutes are brought to your attention. Members, are you content to note and to forward Mr. McKee's correspondence to the Audit Office as part of its review of CCNI? Agreed? Is this agreed, members? Mm -hmm. agreed. Um, members, I refer you, refer you to correspondence dated the 13th of April 2021, pages 34 to 39 of your pack from Sue Gray, the Accounting Officer and Permanent Secretary at the Department of Finance regarding localised restriction support scheme over payments. Ms Gray has provided details of an ongoing review of the approved LRSS applications and the Department is seeking recovery of LRSS payments for some businesses that have been overpaid or paid in error. Members, the correspondence details the background to the Department's actions and some further details on the number and type of cases involved. The Department has recently written to 480 businesses during the week Ending the 2nd of April 2020, uh, one regarding the overpayment, and sorry, 2020, regarding the overpayment of incorrect payment and LRSS support. The amount in, involved uh, in these cases is £4.26 million, which is less than 1.6 of all payments made under the scheme to date. <coughs> a has provided a table setting out the number of applicants affected and the total value of the LRSS payments issued in these circumstances that will be subject to repayment or reduction from future payments. The correspondence has been copied to the Comptroller and Auditor General and the Finance Minister has written in similar terms to the Chair of the Finance Committee. Uh, Ms Gray will continue to keep both committees informed of developments. Mr Donnelly, have you any comments you wish to make around those issues? Um, first of all, I think it's a good thing that uh, the Department is up front on these errors and has written to both committees. Uh, there will be errors and mistakes because a lot of these schemes were introduced at great pace. Um, and um, the most important thing is uh, that when errors and mistakes are found, that they're acknowledged, there's transparency and upfrontness. So that, that, that is a good thing. Uh, in this particular case, um, I suppose that most of the overpayments relate to businesses that were not eligible under the scheme like takeaways and food businesses, so uh, the Republic is learning from that. We will obviously have a, a more detailed look at it when we, we audit the next set of the Department's accounts. Okay. Okay. Uh, members, I suggest we asked um, Ms Gray to keep us updated on this matter, and have any members any comments or questions around these issues? Okay. Clark, can you make sure that's conveyed to Sue Gray that we're kept up to date around the issues. 
Members are referred to correspondence dated the 15th of April at page 40 of your pack from Mr. Peter May, the Accounting Officer and Permanent Secretary of the Department um, of Justice, confirming his intentions uh, to give evidence on the 7th uh, inquiry, speeding up justice, avoidable delays in the justice system. It can, uh, included biographies of those who will be attending Peter May, the Accounting Officer, Anthony Harbison, Deputy Secretary. Access to Justice and Director of Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service, Glenn Capper, Head of uh, Justice Performance, Department of Justice, and Mr. Peter Lunney, uh, Chief Operating Officer, of Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service. Uh, I suggest we consider whether there is a need for any further, further uh, witnesses. Agenda item 10. Is that agreed? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Donnelly, have you any comments you wish to make around that? Uh, well, I suppose uh, the report that we produced would also have covered um, BSNI and the Public Prosecution Service, and to have a holistic view of the yeah. issue, uh, I, I think there should be rep there should be witnesses. I, I think that's a very good point. How often do we hear um, in our own constituency work about the police are frustrated around these issues? Uh, and I do think it would be important to hear from the police because uh, this is a knock-on effect to our uh, constituents and our constituencies whenever. These things are not seen through, and uh, some people are not um, brought to justice uh, in a way that they should be. So, would members agree that the police be invited? That agreed? I think I'll have to take silence as acclamation. You're all very quiet today. Um, uh, okay. And, and also the DPP. I think Chairman, they're a key player in the in the yeah. protest as well. Okay. So yeah. the Public Prosecution Service. Yes. Okay, members. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> Members, I refer to correspondence dated the 14th uh, of April in your table packed on pages 3 to 11 from the Department of Finance, Fiona Elliott, regarding memorandum reply on PAC's impact review of special educational needs, which is now being presented to the Assembly and is available in the Business Office. As part of the inquiry process, I suggest we add this to next week's uh, agenda for the as a substantial a substantive item. Uh, are members agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Okay, members, we continue and remain in open session. We move to agenda item six, uh, ministerial directions, pages 55 uh, of your pack. Members are referred to correspondence, 14th of April, page 55 of your pack from Sue Gray, the accounting officer, Department of Finance, regarding an update on publishing ministerial directions. Guidance has been issued to all accounting officers on the 2nd of April, advising that from the 1st of April 2021, ministerial directions should be copied to the Treasury uh, Officer of Accounts team, who will then arrange for them to be published as quickly as possible on the D Department of Finance website. Also, that Department of Finance have, have been engaging with the Northern Ireland Audit Office on drawing up a full list of ministerial directions for the 31st of March 2021 since 2007. The draft list has been circulated to departments for checking, and once finalised, this will be published on the Department of Finance website and made available on the Open Data Portal. Ms. Gray states that this is uh, hoped that it is hoped that the hope that the historic list will be finalised and published before the end of April. Uh, members, I refer to your correspondence dated the um, 21st of April 2021. Your pack uh, from uh, page. 13 to 14 from Kieran Donnelly, Controller and Auditor General, regarding the late notification of ministerial directions from the Department of the Economy. The Permanent Secretary of the Department of Finance has agreed to publish a comprehensive list of all ministerial directions issued since devolution in 2007. Mr. Donnelly has stated this week uh, work identified seven schemes or scheme extensions covered by ministerial directions obtained by the Department of the Economy over the period 22nd of October 2020 to the 5th of March 2021 details of which had not been forwarded to uh, his office. Mr Donnelly will continue to liaise with the Department of the Economy and Department of Finance to agree a list of publications and identify what lessons can be learned to ensure that this does not happen again. And Mr Donnelly will formally notify the committee on a regular basis around these issues. Members, also in your table pack, pages 15 to 18, is the list of 32 ministerial directions issued on the, since April 2020, outlining their status that is, late notification, potential delay or no delay. Um, Mr Donnelly, anything you want to comment on around this? Uh, I'll just give you the background to how this late notification emerged. Uh, it was actually really the, your own recommendation to finance that uh, you know, we would uh, 
uh, get a, a backdated list and publish them. So when DOF were looking at uh, their records and matching against our records, uh, we found there were a number that just hadn't been sent to us. Now, ma managing public money is very, very clear uh, that um, if there is a direction, they should be sent to me, and then I, in turn, send them to you. So there, there's been obviously a breakdown in, in the process, and we'll have to see why, why that actually happened. Now, some of these uh, seven seem to be extensions, but not all of them. There, there was one there, the uh, wet pubs, business support scheme, bed and breakfast, guest house accommodation. So there's, there's a few there. So now, uh, they're coming in thick and fast at the minute, so we'll probably need time next week to go through them all one, one by one. Okay. Uh, so you can see there, there, there's real, particularly the Department of Economy, I think it leads the league table just on the sheer number of, of directions. Everything that moves around COVID has a, a direction. Uh, and that includes the ones that weren't sent to us. So um, th there are issues there in getting, getting the process right. Okay. Um, members, any comments? Mr. If I may, Mr. Chair, first of all, I think, not to pat ourselves on the back, but it sounds like because we asked for this, th this has come to light in part, so that's a good thing. Um, uh, second, um, uh, it does seem a relatively significant, as I say, but a relatively significant point that several ministerial directions were not notified to the audit office and may not have been if this request was not made? Or um, do you know, do you expect any more skeletons in the closet going back to 2007? Uh, I hope not. Um, no, um, so I'm not aware of, of any others, so whether it's a, it's a, it's a one-off. Uh, but it's all about communication between different bits of the system and um, I suppose uh, what I do know is the Department of Finance just uh, sent queries to Economy a few weeks ago and it, it took them a while to actually get to the bottom of this so um, like, to me it seems basic communications basic process and uh, so um, there should be learning out of this. So it, it looks like there were uh, seven in total? Yes. Yep. Okay, members, any others? Okay. I think Andrew Muir has hand up. Andrew Muir, sorry. Sorry, Chair. Um, just to echo the words of Matthew, it's good to get the, finally get a list of these, but I think we need to be asking the Department of the Economy why this was allowed to occur, because it, in a, if you're in a ministerial direction, it's quite a serious act. And as part of that, the audit office will be informed and then consequentially the PAC. So we need to understand the rationale why this occurred, because we think really we need to ensure it doesn't occur again. I think those are questions we absolutely will ask, uh, obviously, but I, I think we need to wait until the work is completed uh, and then we can have a holistic a picture of, of the of the situation. Okay? Yeah, bro. Okay, thank you. Um, members will remain in open session to hear additional evidence on our sixth inquiry generating electricity from renewable energy. Uh, can I ask broadcasting to bring in our witnesses, Mr Stephen Ingew, Mr Michael Thompson, Mr Russell Smith. Um, Mr Ingew, Mr Thompson, Mr Smith, can you hear us and see us okay? Can you hear us? Sure, okay, Chair. Okay. Um, members uh, and officials, it would be helpful when we're managing this part of the meeting. You use your hands up facility to indicate uh, if you want to speak, if you're joining us remotely, please. Um, members, we, we continue in open session and we move to agenda item seven, which is the inquiry into generating electricity from renewable energy, evidence session one. Pages 57 to 207 of your pack. And at this stage, I would invite Mr. Donnelly, uh, the Comptroller and Auditor General, Mr. Stuart Stevenson, TOA, and Mr. Kyle Bingham, the Semi Sport Officer, to join the meeting. Mr. Stevenson, can you hear and see us okay? Good afternoon, Chair. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, members, today we will have two further evidence sessions regarding the sixth inquiry into generating electricity from renewable energy. 
The first evidence session is with um, Mr. Agnew, Head of Renewable NI, Mr. Thompson, Managing Director of Everon, and Mr. Russell Smith, Partner KPMG. And the second evidence session is with Professor Hughes of the University of Edinburgh. The witnesses will, are all attending remotely. Uh, and uh, so that you know, um, gentlemen, Mr. Donnelly and is present in the meeting uh, with us at the moment, and uh, Mr. Stevenson and Mr. Bingham are joining us remotely. Members, in your pack are the following papers, pages 57 to, two th uh, to 107 of your pack are both evidence sessions. The Northern Ireland Audit Office report on generating electricity, pages 57 to 136. KPNG report on renewable and uh, renewable NI, an economic review of small scale wind, pages 137 to 178. Witness biographies, 179 to 180. Um, and the Northern Ireland Audit Office restricted suggestion questioning 181 to 184 of your pack. Um, an article by Mr. Peter Donaghy regarding uh, Northern Ireland's expense, expensive push towards renewable electricity in your pack at 185 to 192. And briefing from Mr. Uh, sorry, Professor Hughes, School of Economics, University of Edinburgh, on small wind generation in Northern Ireland in your pack at pages 193 to 207. So we are now in session one, Mr. Agnew, Mr. Thompson and Mr. Smith, I invite you to make an opening statement and then uh, we will open up uh, the meeting and the committee to questions from the members. Um, is that okay? You have enough? Okay. So who's going to lead then? I'll, I'll take the lead, sure, and introduce my, myself and my colleagues, if that's okay. Okay. Can everyone hear Mr. Agnew okay? Yeah. Okay. Carry on. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. So I'm Stephen Agnew, Head of Renewable NI. We're the trade association for the renewable electricity industry in Northern Ireland. With me, I have Michael Thompson, Managing Director of Everrun, a wind asset management company. Um, and Michael would have direct experience in, in some of the projects we, we'll be discussing. Um, we also have Russell Smith, partner of KPMG. Russell was the, the led the work on the economic review of small scale wind. Um, uh, the narrow was the main policy lever um, used to achieve the 40% renewable electricity target by 2020. Um, and in fact, it achieved 49% uh, renewable electricity um, generation in 2020. And as the KPMG report shows, at a lower cost than was forecast, uh, lower cost to consumers. Uh, small scale wind specifically, there has been 400 million pounds worth of investment in Northern Ireland, uh, largely in rural areas, with 500 jobs created. And investors can expect to receive a rate of return of 9.7% on average. In the opinion of Renewable NI, by every metric, the narrow has been a success. Um, and we believe that's backed up by the, the KPMG report. I'm happy to take any questions, sure. Okay. Uh, do any of your colleagues wish to make any comments before we move to questions? Mr. Thompson, Mr. Smith, do you have any comments you want to make? No, yep. not at this no, time. Nothing in addition to that. Okay. Uh, Mr. Muir. Uh, Andrew, I think you might be muted. Sorry, apologies. Um, Take two. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you, Sharon. Thank you for the witnesses for coming here today. Uh, one of the key issues that's been rising in relation to the, this inquiry has been in relation to the access to data set to an analysis of the returns around um, renewable obligations. And it's clear that uh, in terms of um, KPMG report, that uh, there was access to 134 data sets. Do the witnesses feel it's right that they have access to that amount of data, but yet the Northern Office did not get the same level of equivalence in terms of access? Um, I, 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 the data set that we produced came from our members of Renewable NI. Um, to the best of my knowledge, prior to the publication of the audit office report we were were never asked for this data so it was in response to the publication of the report that we 
sought to collate the data and commissioned um, KPMG, I suppose, to, to collate the data and, and analyze it. Um, since we, we have done so and since we published the KPMG report, um, as, as um, members may be aware, we've been working with the Department for Economy and indeed our members have agreed to to share that data um, uh, with with certain confidentiality clauses, I suppose, to to ensure that no commercial confidence is breached. Um, in terms of the scheme, you don't think it's a key lesson learned that as part of the criteria for accessing for those rocks would be to you know, have access to that data and to allow the department to have full oversight in terms of the rates of return. Um, I, I think it's a fair point, um, you know, and, and absolutely in any scheme, as I say, I, I think the the narrow has been a, a huge success, and I, I find it hard to think of many examples in government that have that have been so successful. Um, but certainly, lessons can be learned in terms of where uh, I suppose public support has been provided for industry and um, the the level of oversight of the department, but. Um, I think a lot of the, the data is in the public domain and, and, and maybe bring in Russell to, to speak some more to what is available. Um, you know, largely what is, is unavailable has been the, the, I suppose, the um, commercial considerations of some of our members. But Russell, maybe if, if you want to speak a bit more to um, some of the data that is available. Yeah, thanks. So, look, we, we have um, detailed at the back of our report, you know, the key inputs to our, our analysis. The majority of data is from the public domain. For example, one of the key pieces of data is the amount of energy that these turbines are actually producing. That is coming from a fully a publicly available off-gem, uh, and, and we use data from, you know, the 100% data set for, for small-scale turbines. They're really the only two pieces of information uh, that were not in the public domain are the average capital cost expended in building one of these assets and the annual operating cost. Um, we have, however, we have effectively aggregated 134 and we have provided a the, the mean average of that. So we have provided in the report the average. All we haven't done is given the breakdown of the individual 134 that make up that average. Um, you know, so, so that data point. Equally, I would point out that the average that we came to is wholly consistent with the reviews commissioned by DEC um, in GB and by DEC in Northern Ireland. So the average number of around 600,000 is consistent and the studies commissioned by the government did come to very similar numbers. Yeah, it's just the audit office estimated the annual operating cost to be 5,000 pounds, where the figure from KPMG report is 38,000 pounds. There's a very significant discrepancy between those. And I'm just trying to understand the rationale for that. Yeah. Yeah, Stephen, go ahead. yeah, it's just going to say, I suppose the, the, the difference is there was an assumed figure by the audit office um, and the figure that we used is based on the average across 134 real life projects. So um, I, I certainly would contend that, that our data in that regard is more robust. I, it's maybe worth just noting um, Everon is an operator of turbines, so that's this is what we do. We we maintain and support them. Um, the audit office uh, quoted figure of five thousand is is according to their own report for servicing. That is only one small aspect of the operating costs of a turbine. Um, not least things like rates, repairs, insurance, land leasing costs. There are a whole range of costs involved in. Uh, annually in, in maintaining and, and supporting wind turbines. The audit office have picked one as part of their calculation. The KPMG report um, gives the list of, of what's actually involved in doing this. So it, that that's where the difference lies. Yeah, just two more questions and I'll be myself. 40% uh, <clears throat> of the rocks uh, went to about 13% of the wind generating capacity and I have a real question whether that is good value for money, and I'd just be interested in whether the view is whether that was good value for money. So Renewable NI represents both large-scale developers and small-scale project owners and, and developers. Um, and if your objective is to achieve the most renewable electricity at the lowest cost to the consumer, undoubtedly going large-scale is, is the way to do that. 
However, and, and I suppose this is up to policymakers, um, there are other um, benefits of investing in small scale, um, not least the, the income that brings to, to rural areas um, in terms of farm diversification and indeed um, decarbonizing the, the agriculture sector. Um, as well as that, it's fair to say, as, as we now face a net zero target, albeit that's not where we were in 2010, um, I think we're going to need large scale and small scale, onshore and offshore, wind, solar, tidal, and you know, it's a case of all technologies to achieve that. It, it, it's not a case of, of, of one or the other or choosing the best one. We, we, we need to take every advantage we have to decarbonize our economy if, if, if we're going to, to tackle the climate emergency. And so in that regard, I think small scale has a very valuable role to play. Um, thank you, Stephen. I think um, I would agree with you about the need to, to meet that net zero target and for decarbonization. It's a, a key challenge in Northern Ireland. We need to be doing more, more to be able to meet that, especially on the day that it is today. I think the issue for me is that confidence is somewhat knocked as a result of some of the issues around this inquiry. So for example, turbines being erected without planning permission or uh, in relation to anaerobic digesters not having the appropriate environmental licenses. And there is a perception given that the department is partly having it reliant upon the industry rather than having its own ability to independently take its own decisions without that reference. To the, to the industry, it's important to engage and consult, but they do need to have that independent rigor. So it's just what your views around that, because it has not confidence around that, and I think it's important that that was restored. To me, the best way to do that is to ensure the department can act much more independently without that full reliance upon the industry. Um, I, I mean, I think it's fair to say that, that from October to through to December, that three months, the, the majority of, of my work was dedicated to try to repair the reputation of an industry that I think was un, unfairly damaged. Um, you know, I, I think as the KPMG report shows, um, this is an industry that has delivered for, for Northern Ireland on a number of fronts. Um, in terms of turbines erected without planning permission or indeed there was reference to to not paying rates in some cases and um, that that's something we we, we we condemn and indeed the appropriate measures uh, should be taken in, in, in that regard but I think equally it, it's worth pointing out that um, across the the um, I think it was 1200 generating stations that the, the report referred to it was very much a minority and indeed if you want to connect to the grid you have to have planning permission so it, it, it would be a very small minority of certainly wind turbines that, that, that would not um, have planning permission um, so you know I, 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 I take your point and share your concern and indeed I might, I might bring Michael in just uh, if you maybe want to speak to to some of the, 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 the harm that has been done in terms of investment. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely, Stephen. Look, confidence is fragile, absolutely. Um, and I think we all know of other renewable generating technologies that there have been difficulties with in the past. Actually, this sector is, is as Stephen says, a success. You might expect me to say that working in it, but I've only worked in it for, for the last three years or so. Um, and it is achieving what it is intended to achieve, which was to stimulate the amount of renewable energy, re renewable electricity in the sector up to 50% is where we're at at the minute. But we have a lot further to go and we need to invest a lot further. And that's why the confidence is, is so important and an accurate picture of how the industry has performed to date and how that advises energy strategies going forward is really crucial. So, I mean, we, we very much welcome the opportunity today to talk to you guys and and working with the department and others indeed you know organizations like the audit office we will cooperate with them certainly my company was never asked to feed into the uh, data sets for their original report and we could have we could have certainly given them some guidance there is commercially sensitive information at play here um so you know we have to be a little bit careful uh, we're competing against other companies similar to ourselves so it's not a question of just full transparency, but we have to find a mechanism where we can be transparent to build confidence. And we have seen, as, as Stephen has said, he worked hard to help us rebuild confidence, but we have certainly seen missed investment, investment opportunities 
where uh, existing operators have been cautious about investing further uh, in the last period because simply they don't they, they don't want to attract negative sentiment, right or wrong. So we, we need a good positive uh, message coming from today, and we're we're sort of more than more than happy to be open with uh, what you need to do in terms of planning. Just to to touch on that quickly, uh, absolutely echo Stephen's comments. Um, a turbine that's put up without planning permission uh, shouldn't be there, and it, it harms the rest of us when that when and if that happens. I don't believe it happens that often, truth be told. Um, but the planning authorities have the tools to get that taken down again. So uh, it's not just uh, people recklessly putting turbines up wherever they fancy to make money. That that doesn't happen. Um, so you know, planning is an issue. Rates is an issue. I can't speak to AD. We don't do anything on the, on that side of renewable generation. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Agnew, in response to um, Mr. Buer's last question, you talked about the industry's reputation being unfairly damaged. Can I ask why you think that was and what you did in terms of your answer to that uh, to address the, 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 the issues that were damaging it uh, and put, to put it right? Well, to take the second part first, the, what we did was commission KPMG to uh, to conduct um, a, a full study of the small scale sector, a uh, small scale wind sector, and um, to I suppose uh, as much as possible uh, carry out recommendation six from the audit office report, which was to establish actual rates of return for the sector. So the audit office report, I, I would say, speculated on what rates of return could be within the sector based on the limited data they have. What we did was amass a significant, um, significantly more robust data set um, to establish, can't quite establish actual rates of return because we can only do that after the, the scheme ends. But um, what we established was um, expected rates of return um, based on actual costs. <coughs> And do you think the reputational damage has been repaired? I, I hope some way. Look, uh, speaking candidly, it was it was a case of harm reduction. Once the media had had run with the story it wanted to run with, and I think it's it's worth noting. For example, we informed BBC Spotlight that um, within two weeks of them being due to air, that we would have a report, um, and and could they delay the airing of their program and. They had no intention of doing that, so I think uh, there there is an opportunity for dark journalists to to wait to hear the full picture before making their mind up. But I think the narrative was too compelling, um, and it was a case of don't let the facts get in the way of a good story or a bad story from our point of view. Can you tell us what level of engagement you've had with the department uh, around the the figures quoted in your report and? Um, also, in terms of the underlying information you report with the department providing all the required information, I mean, uh, are you an ongoing conversation with the department, and how is that progressing? So, I, I received a request from the department for access to the, the KPMG data set on the 12th of March, um, our small scale working group um, who, that supplied that data met on the 23rd of March and agreed that um, with, you know, with certain confidentiality um, uh, agreements in place in terms of basically the, the, the data would only um, be accessed by the department, by the utility regulator on that condition that we were content to share the data. We had a meeting with the department on the 1st of April and the department and the utility regulator on the 1st of April to ascertain what exactly they, they needed. Um, I think it was unclear at the conclusion of that meeting what exactly we needed to supply to satisfy, I suppose, recommendation six from the audit office and, and the department's own work. Um, I understand there's been, uh, I've sort of stepped back at this stage and it, it's, you know, the, our permission's been given for, for Russell to engage directly with the department utility regulator on this. And I believe, Russell, you, you've had a, a further meeting since, since the last one I attended. 
Yeah, we met with the dentists of the department and of the utility regular last week, uh, had a very positive discussion. Um, you know, we went in detail through our entire methodology, our approach, our data collection methodology, our data sets, um, and we're waiting for them to come back with a clarification following consideration of that session, what further information they need. So we're certainly making ourselves available. You know, we have absolutely nothing to hide. The, the, the data is very transparently being analysed and uh, we can support uh, in any way we can. Have you time scale as to when they'll be back to you? Uh, I'd expected maybe to have got it by now, but I, I assume, uh, I was, I'm hoping that we'll have clarity this week. Okay, so thank you. Mr O'Toole. Thank you, um, and thank you all for uh, coming and giving us evidence today. Um, it's clear that um, small-scale wind has been subsidised more generously than large-scale wind, both you know, relative to large-scale wind in Northern Ireland and relative to small-scale wind in other jurisdictions. Would you accept that? I, I would say when you say more generously, I would say it's according to need. Um, so, uh, you know, the... It, it, it's as as we've discussed. Um, it, it requires a greater level of support um, to to make it economically viable than large scale did at that time. I think going forward, we're we're in a different position. But you know, back then, uh, I think that based based on the analysis by KPMG, and I'll bring Russell in on this. You know, it, the, the the level of four rocks. Was, was necessary to stimulate the, the, the investment and Russell can speak to working on projects at the time um, in terms of trying to secure finance, just how difficult that was. Um, Russell, if I could bring, bring you in on that. Yeah, like it, it's clear and the, and the rock system gives a very, very easy measure of, of relative support. You know, large scale wind farms receive you know, between 0.9 and one rock per megawatt hour of electricity generated, small scale wind um, that we're talking about today receives four. So, you know, it's a, it's a very simple mechanism to see that the level of support is, you know, around four times higher. So there's no, no question about that. Um, one of the second parts of your statement where there was that Northern Ireland got higher support than other, um, other locations or other areas. You know, I don't think that's necessarily a correct statement. Um, the, certainly in 2010, when the scheme came in, the level of support available in GBE was higher for, for exactly the same turbines. Um, and uh, you know that that uh, evolved over time, but um, for for a large period of time, the level of support was higher. It would also be say if you look at the total cost of electricity generated from renewables in its entirety in Northern Ireland versus renewables generated in GB, the cost of renewables per megawatt hour is lower in Northern Ireland than GB um, than England and Wales. So, so Northern Ireland's cost base, um, including small scale wind, still produces a cost. Which is lower than GP and therefore, you know, would represent relative uh, value for money. But you, you mentioned so you, I, I, I don't dispute any of that. But you mentioned earlier on that how um, at one stage subsidy for small scale in GB was more generous than in Northern Ireland, notwithstanding the fact that Northern Ireland, as you say, had a small scale operators in Northern Ireland had more of a challenged for you know in terms of getting started but then post 2011 regression kicked in in gb and that level of subsidy came down and it didn't come down in northern ireland um would you argue that it was still necessary with well, that, that that divergence in generosity I don't, it doesn't have to be the word generosity but that, that divergence in subsidy level was economically necessary to continue um small scale uh, investment here? Um, so certainly there was independent studies commissioned by uh, by DETI, uh, which looked at this question and, and it certainly came to a view that the level of support of four rocks was required still to deliver the return, target return. Um, in, in the UK, there was a cut through the regression system from where it, it dropped below the level of support in Northern Ireland from 2014-15 onwards. You know, that was later criticised um, uh, by uh, par parliamentary bodies um, that it um, uh, was, you know, put below the level that was required. So, you know, I think we've outlined in our report that it's, it's clear that the decision to cut um, subsidy in GB was not driven by any concern of overcompensation, mm -hmm. but driven by a desire to reduce 
the amount of spending on renewables uh, generally. Um, so, you know, I, 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 all, all indications are that the level of support was still required at that time to deliver it. And in fact, the 2014-15 report said that in theory, grid costs had gone up and 4.5 rocks would be required to deliver the same level um, and the department decided against further increases. Um, I think just, just to add to that, the, the, the decrease in support for small scale wind was, was part of a wider package of a move away from onshore wind by the then Conservative government. So it, it was more of a policy consideration um, in terms of that government's priorities as, as opposed to any independent analysis of what was needed to incentivize the sector. Uh, and I'll just quote maybe from a 2018 um, report by the UK Environment Audit Committee. It said, a series of sudden changes to low carbon energy policy in 2015 in GB undermined investor confidence and led to reduction in the number of projects in development. So um, that was sort of the, uh, a, a parliamentary um, review of that decision in 15 in GB. Thank you. And that leads me on to my next question, which is about invest, investor confidence. I've now I've forgotten, one of you mentioned a second ago about the effect of the NIAO report and subsequent media coverage on investor confidence. Are you aware of specific investment decisions that are being stalled as a result of um, the publicity and concern around this? You can bring Michael in on this, please. Yeah, we, we have had some of our uh, customers and asset owners who I wouldn't say solely have made a decision that they're not going to go forward, but certainly they have cited negative sentiment um, as a reason, as part of the reason for delaying. Okay, as, and that is negative, and is that, that's in the last six months, that's since... Yeah. On, on the question of the KPMG's detailed data sets, good to hear that you're engaging and they've been sent to DFE. Have there been conversations about DFE sharing those with NIAO and in a, if necessary, in a kind of anonymized or, um, uh, you know, um, redacted way where commercial matters are at stake? Um, I'll maybe bring Russell in a second. Uh, I suppose it, it's fair to say, given the audit office report, um, that there isn't uh, the, a, a level of trust with the audit office um, amongst our members. I think that that that's been been damaged, rightly or wrongly. Um, that that's the case. We we've shared the information with the department um, and with the utility regulator, um, and I, I would hope there's sufficient public trust in those bodies to provide independent analysis of it, um, and and that that should satisfy recommendation six of the audit office report. Um, I don't know, Russell, if you anything further on that in terms of, uh, you know, again, it, it's maybe worth reiterating most of the data is in the public domain. Most of the data yeah. that's in the, the KPMG data is in the public domain. Correct. Yeah, the, the, the majority of the data is, for example, off um published uh, data on the amount of energy produced by the assets. The department will have to come to their own view on, on future energy prices. The actual value of rocks, um, or the, the, the subsidy itself, is, is in public domain. So, you know, a lot of these data points um, are, are not are, are, are in the public domain are fully available. There is in reality only two data points um, that are not in the public domain, and we have given the arithmetic average of those, which is all that's needed for um, a, 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 an average return to be generated. Um, so, you know, there isn't a, a, an awful lot of mystique around this data set. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, the, the report that we published has sufficient information for anyone to replicate our calculations. Okay, that's fine for me for now. Okay. Um, Mr. Harvey. Indeed, <coughs> Chair. It's just that your report was based on 134 turbines. Could you tell me um, where these turbines are various locations? And how would you have been able to determine what um, <coughs> turbines are target and access the data on? Um, I think it's fair to say, again, I'll bring Russell in, but it's fair to say that the the 134 will be across the country, and um, the, the the average 
load factor of 22%, um, which is basically the, the, the well, I'll get Russell to explain the load factor maybe better than I can, but um, so it, 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 it's what we would see as a representative sample and indeed a, a statistically significant sample, but I'll, I'll maybe pass on to, to Russell to, to run into a bit more detail. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, so, you know, the 134 uh, data points, you know, we, we took a lot of, of time to ensure that they are uh, representative uh, to allow us to produce, you know, what is hopefully a definitive and accurate answer. We took a lot of time, for example, to ensure that they contained an appropriate mix of, of brand new turbines and second-hand turbines, that they contained a representative mix of, of derated turbines and non-derated turbines. Um, we got a mix of, of different um, uh, developers, um, some you know, farm-based uh, landowners, others professional developers. So this is what we believe a, a, a comprehensive and um, representative sample, um, which will have geographic coverage across you know the whole of Northern Ireland. That's good. Good variety of uh, turbines as well as locations. On the thirty-eight thousand pound, um, can you give any breakdown on the costs of maintenance, or do you not have that at all? Um, like, sorry, sorry, I probably don't have the, the absolute um, tip of my tip of my fingers. Um, what I would say is it, it's it's made up of of an O and M contract, so the operation and maintenance. Um, it will be made up of of ad hoc repairs that are needed, and these are you know these are assets which are spinning you know uh, continuously and, and, and need repair. You've got land lease um, to 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 uh, to lease it. You've got a rates bill. You've got insurance. You've got admin. Um, and if you're financing, you've, you've you know associated financing costs. Um, so you know the the number that we have uh, that we produced is is also consistent with the numbers produced by the independent reports commissioned by the department back in 14 and, and 15, both at, at DEC and, and DETI, when you include all cost items. So again, you know uh, to give an extra level of comfort, you know the numbers that we came to are you know almost exactly in line. With where those independent reports also came to, and it goes back to the point: a lot of this information is in the public domain. You know, there's not an awful lot of black box here. Most of this information is in the public domain and can be replicated. Thank you, Jamal. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Mr. Beggs. <clears throat> Again, thanks for your, your information. Um, can I just respond to Mr. Ring? You to start with uh, that the industry has viewed this as an attack on them. I certainly view it as criticism of the department of the criteria that they set for the industry to operate from. So generally, the, the industry is merely operated from the criteria and governance set for them to do so. So I please don't view what, what we're uh, inquiring about as an attack on the industry. It's more how, how it's been set by, by, by government. Now, uh, I'm just trying to get my, my head around the, the, the balance of the cost, because there has been uh, a considerable focus uh, on the growth of small-scale wind in Northern Ireland uh, under our scheme, when that has uh, tailed off considerably in other parts of the United Kingdom. And I, I was looking in 2016, for example, where there was 170 small turbines built in Northern Ireland and only 110 in the rest of the UK. The following year, 234 in Northern Ireland and only six in the rest of the UK being listed. So do you accept that there, there is something different, something significantly different that is incentivising small-scale wind in Northern Ireland, uh, uh, which is not there in the rest of the United Kingdom, and in particular, the four rocks per megawatt hour, uh, my understanding is that is something like £218 per megawatt hour, with the electricity generated about £40 per megawatt hour. Are those the types of figures that are involved here? I'll make a couple of points and then bring Russell in. Just on the, the point, we certainly don't see the PAC's work as an attack on the industry. I think it was the we, we, we felt that given the data the audit office had available to to make a, a statement, albeit a very qualified statement, on potential rates of return that could be achieved. Um we, we, we felt that the the audit office should have been reporting it had insufficient data. To make a statement on rates of return rather than make a, a, a what we call a speculative um, statement. So, and it was, I suppose, ultimately the attacks then came from 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 the media. Um, but certainly, we don't see the work of the committee as, as an attack on on the growth of small scale sector in Northern Ireland compared to to the rest of Great Britain or the rest of the UK. Um, 
the size of the sector is about 12 percent of the overall renewable sector in in northern ireland compared to i think it's 12.2 percent in england and wales so what you'll find is we have more wind in northern ireland but you have more sun in southern england so inevitably you'll see more solar panels go up in in, in the south of england and then you win with wind turbines in northern ireland but maybe russell can speak to that in a bit more detail yeah, look, so I absolutely agree with the, the, the statistics, you know, as you quoted, certainly don't sound um, inaccurate. What I would what I would say is that, you know, you are comparing different jurisdictions at different points in their development cycle and at different points in the government policy positions. Um, you know, just to reiterate what Stephen said, overall, Northern Ireland generates circa 12% of its renewables from small scale wind. Um, so the wind sector, 12% is from small scale wind, the balance from large scale um, in England and Wales exactly the same that 12 percent of their generation is from smaller higher subsidy um generation so you know if you look at this not in a, a single snap shot of a year but more collectively you know higher subsidy smaller scale renewables is almost equal between the two jurisdictions um i think the fact that northern ireland has had a very successful small scale wind sector you know is because it has a very uh, strong wind resource it is one of our natural resources and the, the idea of the of the rock scheme was to promote um, generation um, from the natural resource to the UK. For example, Scotland has a much greater resource of rivers and has three times more hydro deployment than elsewhere in the UK. South of England has a lot higher solar resource and has twice as much solar deployment than Northern Ireland. So I think the fact just shows that Northern Ireland has successfully focused its energies on the resource that it has best available to it. Would you agree that the government has, has set quite a cliff edge in terms of the funding um, in that if, if it's a small scale wind, less than 250 kilowatts hours or kilowatt size, um, my reckoning is it's, it's 258 pounds per megawatt hour would be generated. And if you went over that, the four rocks dropping to one would mean you'd only be earning uh, uh, 94 pounds per megawatt hour. So that's quite a cliff edge for any to set to any industry. So would you accept that government has actually set tariffs which actually prevent anybody putting a medium sized turbine in because there's a huge incentive for smaller ones and greater economics for larger ones? Would that would that be fair to say that? Yeah, that's correct. You know, there there is a cliff edge in the design. You know, that's a, a policy decision. Um, certainly I remember in the design of the scheme there was um, there was reference to this and, and the view was um, certainly in, in GB that to have too many bands and too many tariffs was going to be overcomplicated. Um, but that's, that's a policy decision. But you're absolutely right. There is a cliff edge in, the, in that design. S similarly, in, in setting such a cliff edge, would you accept that we're actually generating less renewable energy than we potentially could by incentivizing derating so that we actually pay greater tariffs for producing less electricity. We um, encourage people to downsize their, their production so that they get higher subsidies. What I would say is like derated turbines, you know, is is it's probably too simplistic just to, to bucket it all into a, a single topic. You know, the, the derating, you know, there's a lot of derated turbines uh, across them. I think it's around 30% of our data set was derated. Um, and you know a lot of this derating, for example, is to accommodate um, into where a grid connection you know can only get to 220 kilowatts instead of 250, and therefore it's necessary to derate to allow it to, to sit in. So you know derating itself um, is um, you know is, is 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 quite a broad concept. Um, equally, the use of derated turbines has allowed these sites to be more efficient um, and to, uh, to to generate you know from from the available land resource and the available size of turbine that can fit in into that that piece of land uh, to generate more efficiently uh, the electricity. Uh, a question then about the KPMG report, um, where you've indicated typical return being 11.3% uh, for smaller turbines and 9.7% and for, for for other turbines. Um, I, I'm just uh, trying to understand how you question some of the assumptions that are, have been put into it, uh, in particular a load factor of 22%, when the load factor during uh, 20, 2016 to 2020 was actually, over that period, an average of 25%. So why did you use, why did KPMG use a figure of 22%, which obviously skews the figures? 
So we, the methodology we adopted, and again, which we've been very open in the document, we use the actual capacity achieved by single, all single turbines in the market from 2010 up to 2016. So the actual capacity factor for six years of actual data, and that took us up to the point that we used as the investment decision. So we said at the point of the average installer making an investment decision, which was 2016, what was the actual historic capacity factor achieved by every turbine to date over six years up to that point, and that was 22%. So I think there has maybe over, uh, since 2016, best, been a, a, a slight rise, you're saying up to 25 in that year. You know, it's not appropriate to take a single year's data point. Some years are windier than others. So we used the old data for six years up until the investment decision point of 2016. So the actual return has been much greater than what you had predicted then, because the actual wind has been much greater? No, I, you know, and I think there's there's other factors to take into account. Like one of the big issues here is it is not possible to determine the actual rate of return that these assets will generate. You know, this is a twenty year investment. Um, you know, the principle we adopted was what was known at the time of someone making the investment decision in twenty sixteen, which was the year when the most of these turbines went up. Um, one of the other factors which will more than outweigh any any difference in in the wind was that energy prices in 2016 were forecast to be a lot higher than they are now expected to be over the coming decades. Um, we have not reduced our IRR expectation because, or our return expectation because of reduced energy prices, but there is significant downward movement in the, the actual price of electricity that these assets now capture. Um, but we fixed it at what they would have expected at the time of, of their investment. And so to keep our, our analysis pure and uncontaminated, you know, we have locked everything of what was known at the time of the investment decision, because it's not fair to judge someone um, on, on a decision which is outside of their control and information, which became known later post their investment decision. A second point uh, in terms of information given to us about that uh, rate of return um, in, in a correspondence from um, Gordon Hughes, the University of Edinburgh, he's indicated that the average capital cost used by KPMG is in the upper echelon, so obviously that will ad adjust the figures. Certainly I'm aware of many of the small-scale turbines that are installed are actually second hands. They're not at the more expensive category, they would be perhaps lower than the figures that you're using. Would that be fair? No, I don't, I don't believe so. So the numbers that we have used, like we came to an average cost of turbine of 570,000. And to be clear, this is, this is the purchase of the asset. This is you know, the refurbishment of the asset. This is the installation of the asset. This is the wider cost involved. You know, this is, there's a, a lot, a lot more than just purchasing of the actual asset. But we used, um, we found 570 to be the average. The majority of our data set was second-hand turbines. Um, so our, our data set was, is consistent with what we believe is, is representative. So the majority of our data set and the average cost was looking at that. I would also say that the independent government studies in 14 and 15 came to a value of 600,000, which was actually higher. So our number is coming to a capital cost that is slightly below what the government's own in, uh, numbers uh, had found. So you know, I, I don't believe that we have gone to the up, upper end of the range at all. Um, it is the pure mathematical average of a data set of 134, which we believe is representative of the makeup of turbines in the, Irish, in the Northern Ireland market. There's also a question in terms of the, the, the operating costs that have been estimated, estimated and a, an indication that many consider them to be high. So can you give us the typical rates? What is the actual figure for a typical rates bill for a 225 turbine? There must be a set figure. What is the land lease cost? I mean, can we have hard figures to try and get an accurate assessment of how your 38,000 average is made up? Yeah, um, let me ask Michael. Um, Michael, are you able to give guidance on, on your view on the average of, of rates costs? I, I, I can give you some some a broad view. So the rates are calculated uh, it, like business rates. So uh, on the income that comes from the turbine uh, is part of that determination. So it will it will vary, uh, but we would certainly. So we're managing turbines on behalf of asset owners. So we're processing some of the, the, that data for them, and we've shared that data with Russell um, and KPMG. A rich bill can be somewhere between two and six thousand pounds per annum uh, for a turbine. So, you know, that that's a data point. It'll depend. Is that on, smaller turbines or is that larger turbines? Is that smaller so turbines the, or larger so, ones? So that's that's turbines operating between one hundred and fifty kilowatts and two hundred and fifty kilowatts. So the the band of which we 
uh, tend to operate. Um, so if, if that helps. Um, land lease costs, again, uh, quite often will be a factor of what the turbine will actually generate. So what's the uh, production capacity from it? Um, but they tend to be between 5 and 10% of the income that is generated from the turbine goes back to the landowner uh, if it's not actually their turbine. Um, I think in terms of other operating costs, it, it, I mean, we, we've all provided this data. So the 138 uh, in the data set is from a number of operators. We, we're included in that, and, and we all provided our actual data. We haven't seen each other's data because obviously uh, there's a lot of competitive uh, edge to this. Um, but I can tell you, you know, to service a turbine, um, to, to give you a feel for it, yes, uh, so you would service a, a turbine twice annually, typically, but, but like it's a large mechanical device, so think of it in car terms, you want to service uh, the machinery regularly. And to do that requires sending two trained and skilled uh, engineers to the turbine who can safely uh, climb the turbine, which can be anything up to 50 meters high, um, they have to have a van stocked with equipment. Um, and they spend a day there servicing the turbine, changing oil, changing filters, checking it for leaks. And that's just the basic service twice a year. Um, so, you know, the, the quoted number in the audit office report of around about £5,000 for pure servicing, that's probably correct. Um, what's, what's in addition to that are, are repair costs. And these are, are large mechanical devices high in the air, being buffeted by, by strong winds at times. So they do break, it's as simple as that. And again, we have to send engineers out there with the skills and the capability and the tools to repair them. To give you a feel for repair costs, because I think this, this might give you a quantum. It, so turbines have a gearbox in them, which is probably the, the most expensive single component. If that uh, requires a repair, it generally requires taking the gearbox out, which requires a crane to come on site, which means you have to have access to the site uh, and maintain that access. Um, the repair of a gearbox of this type, so this 150 to 250 kilowatt band, what we, what we regard as small scale wind, can run anything up to 50 to 60 thousand pounds uh, to, to take the, the gearbox out, have it repaired, have it reinstalled, and the turbine back operational. So it gives you a feel for it. Now, that's not something you would do every year, you would hope, but in the lifetime of a turbine, you might expect that level of repair to happen a couple of times in the 20 years. Certainly, after 10 years of life, most turbines, the manufacturer would say, should be fully refurbished again. So um, to manufacture spec, if you ask Vestas, for instance, as a, as a turbine manufacturer, they would say after 10 years, when the cell down, which is the, the box on the top of the turbine, the blades come off and refurb everything. And again, those costs are in the, the, in the KPMG report as part of the lifetime cost of just keeping that turbine uh, operational. So, so the repair costs are, are significant, and we can be at turbines you know, every two or three weeks if something trips, um, if there's a repair that's required. Um, the, the last point I would make, you mentioned earlier about second-hand turbines and the cost for buying them. Like a lot of things, you can buy a second-hand uh, product cheap, the quality of it uh, will determine how much more you spend on it over the rest of its life. Um, so generally turbines where we have put them up if they were second hand, um, we would have refurbished them. So we would again have deinstalled the gearbox, deinstalled the generator, um, looked at the <coughs> blades, made the blades with, with composite repairs. All of that money uh, is what's within the, the 570,000 development cost. So it's not just as simple as saying, well, you can buy a turbine for for 50 grand, you can, of course, you will spend that every year trying to maintain it uh, if you don't refurbish it properly. So th there are a lot of operating costs here. Hopefully that gives you a flavor for it. But Turbine that, types are different, so some will cost more than others. But, but, um, but all the data is in the data set that, that the industry has provided to KPMG and, and which they have um, taken away and consolidated. None of us have access to, to anybody else's data. So we, we trusted KPMG. To, to take the data and consolidate it and, and produce the results. We've had no uh, undue influence over, over their exercise and um, their process in that, in that sense. That, that, that's that been very useful. Uh, the, the one figure I didn't get an estimate of was insurance. Now, that shouldn't be particularly confidential in that everybody will get different quotes from different insurers, so everybody will know roughly what the insurance cost is. So what's the typical insurance cost? Sure. It, it, uh, uh, 
and inevitably I'm going to say there's a little bit of variability here. Um, early in the industry, you could get insurance that would cover against uh, re repair costs, for instance. Um, those policies were more expensive. They tend to, they tend to have gone away as insurers have, have realized that the cost of repairs are a lot higher. Um, there's also uh, a factor of whether you insure against business interruption. So when the turbine, if and when the turbine is broken or, or uh, non-operational for an extended period of time, you can insure against business interruption, just like most business insurance. Uh, I'm hedging with you slightly off the top of my head here. Uh, I'm going to say insurance, again, is, is probably similar to rates. I, I think, you know, in the region of, of two to 3,000 up to six, 7,000, depending on the turbine, and that covers public liability. Uh, that's just on the insure, uh, just on the turbine. Companies like ourselves, we don't own, own the turbines, but we also have uh, insurance costs built into our cost base for employers' liability, for our, our engineers uh, being safely able to climb up and down turbines. I, I am happy, you know, after this session to, to dig out uh, a range of insurance costs and advise those. But I, I think off the top of my head, it's it's in that range from two, three thousand up to six. And, and just for clarity, that two to three thousand pound insurance, that's just covering the public liability side of things. That's not covering uh, machine breakdown and, and, and gaps in production, or is it? Uh, so the, the higher end of that would probably include business interruption, so yes, gaps in production. It, our experience is that, that insurance to cover repairs is pretty much non-existent in this market anymore. Uh, there are very few insurers that, um, that offer that, and we typically don't. Um, uh, our insurance companies um, typically don't offer that. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Mr Hilditch. Thank you, Chair. Um, gentlemen, very welcome this afternoon. Um, could, could you justify the statement that derating turbines is innovative? So derating turbines is something that takes place as the technology evolves. So in, in that sense, as, as the technology gets more efficient, um, you would install a more efficient turbine. Um, it's about maximizing the uh, value of the site. So um, as members may be aware, the grid connection is, is a highly sought after commodity. Um, so you're, you're, you're highlight your uh, you're maximizing each each connection as well as that you're you're maximizing the amount of renewable electricity from the site so you know it, it's a case of potentially you could have two you know one turbine and um, producing the level of electricity maybe that a an older smaller turbine would have would, would have produced so um i i think again coming back to my point earlier about ultimately if our goal is to achieve net zero we, we, we absolutely need to maximise um, our renewable electricity output, um, and derating is one of the ways of, of doing that. I, I don't know if Russell or Michael want to, to come in any any further than that. Michael, maybe some experience of derating turbines, etc. Uh, um, we do. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure where the statement um, that it is innovative comes from. I mean, it's a it's a mechanism that allows you to maximise. Uh, the production from a site, and you know we need to produce more uh, renewable electricity. So if you can produce more from an existing site using a larger turbine that's derated, then then that's a good thing. Bear in mind that I think Russell mentioned earlier the the capacity limits are not just to do with um, the the rock scheme. There there are considerable grid restrictions. So there are. Um, a lot of sites where the maximum availability that is is there to export to the NIE and grid is maybe 150, 225, 250. Um, and so the operator has to comply with that. Now, they, they can put a turbine up that doesn't, doesn't generate at a higher level than that restricted limit, but generates more as it gets there. And that is more energy generated. And, and, We'll say, we would say that's a good thing uh, because that's a, a higher level of generation. So it's not a given just to say they're derated to, to bring it into a band. Um, and if you didn't have derating, you know, it could all go to the grid because frankly, the grid wouldn't be able to take it. Um, so th these are some of the things that, you know, over the last 10 years, operators have been trying to grapple with. How do they get the most out of exporting to the grid? What's the right turbine to put off? There's, there has also been, you know, 
we've talked about second hand turbines you, you know you have to look at what's the availability of turbines at a time and if you can get uh if all that's available is a slightly larger turbine that, that gets derated um to fit with the the requirements of the grid well that's what's available that's what what operators are going to go forward with thank you yeah and that, like, just to, to make two quotes which i think are relevant to this you know when the eu commission um, signed off on the introduction of four you know they noted that as the renewable obligation scheme rewards output there is an ongoing incentive for installations to increase their efficiency to maximize uh, their reward and DETI, when it introduced the scheme in, in their consultation, you know, they said the renewable obligation is beneficial in that it is only paid for electricity produced, creating incentives to maintain and to seek to maximize output. You know, so this, you know, derating and the concept of derating is, is fully within the spirit and the intention. And the scheme is designed to encourage people to continuously increase the amount of output because they only got they only get paid for the more output they produce, which is the output that um, the scheme is looking to incentivize. Okay, so more, more economics there, uh, innovative. Uh, can, can you justify the statement, sorry, submissions, the submissions to uh, on scrutiny of the members, uh, some of them were self-submissions on the data? Some, some, was that correct? Some of the users were uh, making self-submissions to the report, to gather in the information? So this is the KPMG data set? Yes. Are you saying? Yeah, so certainly, yeah, the, the information that we have obtained, as I said, where possible, where it was in the public domain, we sourced the information and referenced it from the public domain. So, for example, the output number we've used is not not supplied by members, but the actual output is recorded by Ofgem. Um, the capital cost and the operating costs were supplied by, uh, by members to KPMG. Um, we had a number of steps to ensure that that was accurate. So one was we undertook a, a verification of the actual costs of operating maintenance and capex back to original invoices, um, which were, were shared by K to KPMG on a confidential basis. Uh, so back to the original cost of the turbine, the, the invoice for that turbine or the repairs, etc. cetera. Um, secondly, um, we compared all our numbers to the studies previously commissioned in the sector, for example, DETI um, and, um, and DEC. And again, there was no a major discrepancy. In fact, it was remarkably close to our numbers. Uh, and thirdly, KPMG itself has access to other data points um, from, from, from its uh, work, uh, and we were able to, to cross-reference and verify. So, you know, all, all, all available information methodologies and mechanisms for us to verify the information was used. Um, and, and we're very comfortable uh, to, to stand over the the, uh, the numbers utilised in, in our report. Okay, thank you. Uh, the Department of the Economy, economy targets 70% of electricity from renewables by around 2030. Uh, what, what's your best estimate in relation to the provision of that through wind turbines? Would, would you see 50%, 30% for projected electricity needs? To date, eighty-five percent, roughly, of renewable generation has been from wind, and certainly for the next decade, I, I wouldn't expect that to change massively. Um, as we get towards twenty thirty, moving into maybe the twenty thirty to thirty-five period, um, I think we'll, we'll we'll see considerable deployment of offshore technologies. Um, but I think the uh, as things stand, because for example, the energy strategy is only due at the end of this year. Um, it takes between sort of eight to ten years from conception to connection for an offshore project. Um, so I, I think the likelihood is that the, the majority of the seventy percent, or indeed eighty percent, that renewable NI is calling for, um, will be from offshore wind with a, a significant amount of, or sorry, from onshore wind with a significant amount of of onshore solar as well. Um, but as I say, I think in the, the next decade, I think that's when we'll, we'll really start to see other technologies play a sig significant role. Um, I suppose the other thing to say within this decade, we'll, we'll see a greater deployment of storage. We're starting to see that. There's, I, I think, putting it, um, paraphrasing it, the, 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 the planning system has issues in terms of what to do with storage at the minute. Um, but battery storage as well is going to be a big facilitator for renewables in, in, in the next number of years, as well as um, emerging technologies such as hydrogen production. Okay, thank you. Are there any lessons uh, from this scheme that you think the department should consider 
And I know there's been a bit of liaison with the other jurisdictions in GB, but from what you have learned so far, and have you actually been looking even further afield to where there's expertise in, say, Iceland, Norway, Finland, those sort of countries? Uh, is there lessons to be learned? And uh, how do you view that? I think we, I would ask members not to lose sight of the fact that this has been an incredibly successful scheme. We're at 49 percent renewable electricity in, in Northern Ireland. And, you know, often when I go back to my days as a Green Party MLA, we'd look enviously at Germany. But we, we, we now produce more renewable electricity than Germany as a proportion of, of overall generation. So it's an incredibly good news story. Of course, with any scheme, there'll, there'll, there'll be lessons to be learned. And I think the point about different agencies and again I, this this was a point i made with my political hat on um in terms of things things like discharge consents shouldn't be given to to companies that don't have licenses to operate or planning permission or things like that so in terms of the joined up nature of government absolutely there's there's lessons to be learned and indeed um we actually welcome all six recommendations of the the audit office we there's not one we just disagree with that what we disagreed with was was some of the methodology and in, in, in arriving there but i think it's an incredibly successful scheme and the reality is as an industry we're not uh, not asking for it to be repeated it was of its time it was for uh, a, an industry getting on its feet i think now if we look at great britain if we look at the republic of ireland the the, the schemes and support place to support renewables are more price balancing mechanisms um where where whereby indeed if if the the price of generation goes up or the price of electricity sorry goes up generators pay back to the consumer so it's it's a it's a balance between the consumer and the generator um as to, in terms of sharing the risk it, it, it's entirely different from the old regime which was a subsidy um plain and simple and it was a subsidy needed to kick start an industry that was at three percent um renewable electricity generation in 2005 and now is at 49 percent and as i say as well as that we've created 2,000 jobs We've decarbonized by by forty five percent our our power supply, and indeed we're we're probably um, number one in, in Europe in terms of the proportion of our uh, electricity produced by by onshore wind. So I think it's an incredibly positive story. Yes, there are always lessons that can be learned, but. I repeat what I said at the beginning. I, I, I kind of, I can think of only a few government schemes that have been as successful as this one. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Flynn. Yes. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, so, uh, apologies to the panel because I know some of these questions um, can can seem a bit things. Um, so, sorry if I'm bringing you back to things that you have touched on previously um but Stephen and I think you um I think you commented on this in your earlier remarks if I could just bring it back to the the rate of return and so obviously there was that that significant difference between um your own claims of the rate of return which is 9.7 percent and the audit office at 20 percent and could could you maybe just break in your own view break that down for me again um you know just to try and explain from your point of view how the audit office got their figures so wrong well firstly no apology necessary i haven't done anything that i didn't do in the committee back in the day myself <laughs> um and, and in terms of the difference between our report and the audit office report i, I think the audit office would accept we, we'd access to a, a greater level of data than they had. It, it, it's also worth saying that the 20% figure they referred to was a potential figure that could be achieved. So it was it was speculative rather than than um, I would say, in my view, view robust. But I'll, I'll maybe pass over to, to to Russell to talk about the the different methodology um, between his work and the the work of the audit office as, as we understand it. I think the, the, the key feature and the key sort of reason between that is we, we have worked and the scheme is designed to provide an average return. So, you know, there is going to be in any scheme for any renewable technology, you're going to have a wide variety of returns achieved. We have looked at the average return for 134, which is significant, statistically significant to 
to estimate for the for the population. So we've said the average. Will there be outliers that make no return? Yes. Will there be outliers that could get to twenty percent uh, possible? Um, so I think you're definitely going to be able to find outliers and examples. The scheme, though, is is actively designed, and all schemes of this nature are designed to achieve an average return. And that is because some wind sites will have a very very windy location, and others will turn out to be a lot poorer than expected. For example, so I think the you know the audit office um, you know didn't have access to to the same number. And the example or the quote they have come is, you know, is from a, you know, something at very much the upper end of the range. And I think their report did didn't say that, you know, this is the average achieved. It did say, you know, it's possible the turbine could achieve that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Russell. And I know earlier, I don't know if it was an answer to David there or to one of Roy's questions, but you have provided that breakdown really around. So whenever you were gathering the information around your data, the process, you know, how that could be, um you know, how that could be viewed as reliable data and then the process that you had taken, um, you know, to verify some of that. So you were saying earlier that, you know, a lot of it you were taken from the public domain, that you were members were supplying the information, um, you were verifying some of the invoices. Um, but you had also mentioned that you also have access to other um, data points, so you could cross-reference. And could you just explain that a wee bit more for me, please? what those other data points are, or just what that means? Well, just, you know, KPMG as an organization, um, you know, works across a lot of sectors, including the wind sector. So from other engagements, other mandates, we have knowledge um, of, of what other assets, um, you know, have cost to build. We've been fundraising uh, for clients, et cetera. So we have other data now, we, it's confidential. Um, what we did, we did though, uh, in any information we're using for cross-referencing purposes, we did ask for permission from uh, from any data sources to use that. But it, it was an extra informal layer of, of us being able to get comfort that the numbers we were getting from this other data set were sensible and, and in line with, with any other information we had available. Okay, fair enough. Um, and then maybe, Stephen, um, back to yourself, I think. Um, you mentioned earlier, so... I'm, I'm just trying to tease out a wee bit. So whenever we're talking about the subsidies and, you know, obviously here in the north, we were maybe starting off at a disadvantage. So it was right to try and support, you know, where, where the support was needed. But um, could you maybe outline your thoughts as to why, so when the agreement was reached between the administrations at the outset for the narrow scheme, which was obviously meaning that the north would pay less towards the overall costs of the scheme, um, is there other reasons, in your opinion, why this was the correct decision um, to make at that stage? Um, uh, probably a better one for the department, but as I understand it, one of the key considerations was Northern Ireland's level of fuel poverty and the level of disposable income in Northern Ireland. So I think it was factors like that. I think it was what was deemed was a fair contribution from, from Northern Ireland consumers. Um, I, I, Russell, I, I don't know in your investigations if you find out any more of the, the, the rationale um, uh, to that. Yeah, like there, there, there was, uh, there, th this was a very, a very purposeful decision by government and it was, it was taken, you know, this is completely unconnected with small scale wind. The decision on the socialization mechanism for the RO was, was taken before, you know, the concept of small scale wind subsidization even came about. Um, and it was, you know, to um, provide equalization. I'll just quote from a 2010 study, and it said, when the total cost paid by consumers is considered, that is the electricity wholesale price plus the cost of subsidy, it can be seen that consumers in both NI and GB are paying broadly comparable amounts to support renewable generation. So effectively, the scheme was designed such that the total cost to consumers was equalized across GB and NI. Um, and that, you know, was, as Steve mentioned, for, for a number of reasons, Northern Ireland has, has a different um, uh, energy cost. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. And I think when we had the, at the, the previous session, when we had um, the, the department in front of the committee, you know, with some of the feedback um, from the, the department officials was around, you know, um, well, similar to some of your own remarks where, you know, they were obviously seeing the success and the fact that the schemes exceeded the targets and then they were also referencing the job creation um also throughout so maybe just my final question um i think this might be for michael um michael earlier um matthew had 
made the point around um, you know the impact on consumer interest or you know the uptake of of, of people um, taking part in the scheme at the moment. And uh, you had mentioned that that some some have been put off um, as a result of um, you know some of the public reporting or you know just some of this um, conversation being in the the public domain. And I'm just wondering, Michael, to what extent has this put people off? Um, and do you think that um, you know do you have the double work to do to try and regain some of that confidence? I. I, I... I think we need to see the energy sector renewable and, and all other aspects of it as a real positive. And I think because it, it genuinely is a positive in Northern Ireland. And if we can if we can actually portray it and move on from previous renewable whatevers uh, and the negative connotations that they have, that that is a good thing. Investors have a choice, I suppose, is, is, is what I would say to you. Um, they have typically lots of different things that they're looking at to invest in. Some might be in the energy sector, some might be in a, in a myriad of other things. And, you know, part of the decision making will be, well, what sort of rate of return I can I get? What's the risk of this investment? And we haven't, we haven't really mentioned that much in the session. And, and certainly when the scheme was put in, um, you know, there was a lot of risk in the wind system because people didn't know how it would operate. They didn't know if they would actually get the returns um, that they were calculating. There was a lot of investment put in to prospect sites that didn't come to fruition. That the you know that sort of cost is nowhere in any of this data. You know I have a I have a team of twenty five people here, uh, and a couple of them are still looking at prospecting new sites or looking at our existing sites to see if we can get more out of them. If we don't come up with projects that we either we or or uh, people that we work with to invest want to do, then that money is still spent. So the risk is still there. Um, so I think we, we need to be positive about energy. Um, the energy strategy coming from the executive is a really important thing. And confidence can absolutely be rebuilt. And the, you know, the energy, whether it's renewable energy or just the electricity generating system in this country, could be a real shining light you know, um, for, for, for us as a province, for us as a jurisdiction. Um, but we have to remember that, that investors have a choice and, you know, being um, appearing on, on Spotlight or, 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 dare I say, Nolan, you know, cannot be sometimes the most uh, brilliant experience for people. Um, so, you know, if that puts them off, if that part of the investment decision, that's a challenge for us. I'm not saying we shouldn't have transparency. We absolutely should. We should do what you guys are doing and what the department are doing to establish you know the facts around energy and then we need to be positive about it uh, and, and we can do that and you know this is a good chance to to correct things okay thanks very much to the panel thank you chair okay uh, mr McHugh. uh good chair uh, my chair of the new year is very welcome to the meeting today uh, and i think nearly all of it have been covered uh, and in particular, in terms of, um, um, I'm sure everyone's satisfaction with the success of um, reaching the target of 40% uh, energy renewal uh, by 2020. Now, going forward um, and hoping to achieve our target at 70% by uh, 2030, do you think that, that will require uh, subsidies or incentives? Uh, in place again to in, in order to um, ensure we reach those targets and um, those subsidies are sent much of that again to then to be uh, part parcel of the cost that will be important for the consumer. So uh, I think I made reference earlier to the fact that the, that the industry no longer needs a subsidy. What um, where Great Britain has moved to and where the Republic of Ireland has moved to is a, a price balancing mechanism, essentially whereby investors will get a, a price guarantee over, say, 15 years as it is in Great Britain. So that means, for example, if, if um, and it, it, it all takes place through a competitive auction, so uh, generators are incentivized to bid in as low as possible um, in terms of the level um, that, that, that they can deliver renewable electricity at. Um, one report by BVG 
BVG Associates um, conducted on the Great Britain scheme suggests that over the life of the scheme, a subsidy from generator to consumer of £1.5 billion will be made. Um, and, and basically the reason by that is our, our members would be willing to accept a lower price for their electricity if it's guaranteed. Um, the reason being if, if, if you have you're, you're de-risking the project and therefore it's easier to raise finance. Um, but as I say, it what it has done um, in Great Britain is, is driven down um, electricity prices. Indeed, Russell made reference to the fact that the energy forecasts today, or price forecasts on electricity today, are lower than what they would have been at the beginning of the narrow. That's, I suspect, and, and Russell can correct me if I'm wrong, in large part because renewables have driven down the wholesale price of electricity. Uh, uh, you also alluded to um, uh, in the future that maybe these generations will be located at sea. Mm. Uh, and that uh, given that uh, it's an island, uh, very much uh, the westerly winds that we have here, um, uh, I'm sure it's on the western coast as well too, one would uh, probably be thinking that uh, it would be the more appropriate location. Uh, that would be the case, and there are some implications for the All-Ireland uh, market in terms of uh, the generation of electricity. Well, in terms of the Republic of Ireland, um, we're expecting at the end of this year, I think, the um, first offshore renewables auction, or, or the beginnings of it, I think the, the terms and conditions to be agreed by the end of this year, with the auction taking place early next year. So I think we're about to see in the Republic of Ireland a, a, a significant step in terms of um, significant levels of, of offshore renewable generation. Um, in terms of Northern Ireland, unfortunately, we're a bit behind because we haven't had the policy and consents in place. Um, in terms of your point about being off the West, actually, it's one of the advantages I've seen as, as offshore is, whereas with onshore wind, we, we've, we've had to put the wind in the West to provide power for the East. Um, with offshore, we have the possibility of, of, of bringing generation closer to demand uh, by, by, by setting it on, on the East Coast. Um, but as I say, we're, we're, we're probably, in terms of first projects connecting, it, it's probably, and I, I'm, I'm actually doing a piece of work on this at the minute to get to get a bit more sort of evidence around this, but it's, it's probably going to be around about 2030, the early 2030s, before we see those projects connecting. Because to say, we've essentially had a pol policy gap um, since 2017 in Northern Ireland. Um, and, and really, we're, we're, the energy strategy will be the beginning of us catching up. So in, in a way, we've done incredibly well in the last decade. But, but at the beginning of this decade, we're sort of starting off behind other regions where they have the, the, the price balancing mechanisms in place. So the, it's called the CFD in Great Britain or the RES in the Republic of Ireland. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, can, I, can I just ask you, gentlemen, earlier on in, in terms of the session, um, comments or, or terms were used like confidence being knocked and unfairly damaged in terms of reputation and so on. Um, in anyone's term, a growth between from 2% to 49%. And 2,000 jobs being created is a good news story. Uh, do you think the industry could have been doing more to ensure that that good news story was more out there? And do you think the criticism is justified and the reputa reputational damage unfair? Um, I mean, in terms of doing more, you, 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 I think all members will probably be aware it's always harder to sell a good news story to the media. and. Um, and indeed, before I came in to post, um, my predecessor um, pu published a report um, called The Wind Dividend, which showed that not only um, had uh, the renewable sector created jobs, but in fact, net had reduced um, energy electricity consumers' bills in Northern Ireland. So, you know, we delivered more renewables at, at, at a, a sort of lower cost because on the one hand while we provided a subsidy on the other hand because the the fuel price of renewables is zero and um, it actually brings down the overall wholesale price of electricity so you know that report was produced before my time and i, I know it was supplied to all members because i received it when i was a member um, and i'm sure there was a media release 
and I'm sure it didn't get the level of coverage, for example, that the audit office report got. So a, a bad news story, you know, will 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 always make more headlines. Um, and you know, again, we we did a media release on the KPMG report. Um, it didn't receive the same spot. It did receive coverage. Um, but I, I think of one local journalist who did a lot of work on the audit office report, um, who said he was far too busy to look at the KPMG report. So, um, I, I, you know, we can't control the media, but I would certainly ask your assistance and get the new, good news out there. And I appreciate again the opportunity to do that today. So, in terms of the negative publicity or, or that you may have received, um, what impact do you think that will have on hitting your target of seventy percent? in terms of renewables uh, by 2030? I think, well, I mean, I think I'm pleased that the, the department is holding firm and in, in, in making the case for renewables and indeed the minister, we, we, we welcome her commitment to a target of not less than 70% that she made um, back in September. And, and that has given confidence to the industry because I'll be, I'll be frank, and, and this was predating the audit office report, the, 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 the message coming from the industry was that the, the locational signals from Northern Ireland were poor, essentially, you know, with, with planning issues and grid issues and the lack of, of a, a market mechanism was, was basically a message to investors that Northern Ireland didn't want more renewables. And indeed, when I go back to when I was on the old EDI committee um, and the narrow was closing and I said, what comes next? The response was effectively, we'll just not do renewables for a while. And that message was heard. So I, I think the damage has, has been done and, and been realized in the fact we, we've connected no new renewables in 2019 or in 2020 they're, they're in terms of large scale. Um, and but, but that is starting to write itself. We're starting to see a positive story again in terms of the energy strategy, in terms of the minister's commitment. Um, and indeed, just yesterday, I believe, it was the Nicola Mallon announced um, that she's going to be reviewing planning policy in relation to renewables. So I think investors, again, are starting to see real opportunity in Northern Ireland. Um, and, uh, you know, I hope that continues. Well, obviously, 49% is a good news story for Northern Ireland, 70%, an even better story. Um, good for Northern Ireland, good for the environment, um, good for the, the uh, consumer. How many jobs do you think the 70 per cent, if you reach that target, will be created then? Um, we're actually looking at potentially commissioning KPMG to do another report to, 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 to do that. I, I don't know if Russell would want to get guesstimate at this stage, but um, we, we, we've created 2,000 jobs to date. Um, to reach um, seventy percent would probably take a near enough doubling of renewable capacity. So you could imagine a similar number of jobs being being created. And the two thousand figures renewable electricity solar solely. I know the department, and in, in case any members check their notes, um, cite a figure of five thousand four hundred. That's I suppose the clean energy sector as a whole. Um, but but just purely renewable electricity, there's 2,000 jobs, and as I say, if we double capacity, you would expect to see to see a, a, a corresponding um, increase in job numbers. But on, until we do that detailed piece of work, I, I wouldn't like to put a, any kind of figure on in, on public record. Okay, thank you. I um, those members who've, who've joined us remotely and have had their questions asked and answered, if you could, I could ask you to remove or lower your hands, please. Um, if any other member has any, Mr. Beggs, uh, you'd be very brief because you yeah, did have a long yeah, time. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the rock scheme, um, I'm just interested in how it will impact into uh, the future needs in terms of energy for particularly powering um, transport. Can you clarify uh, if you're aware whether or not um, if, if the electricity generated from the renewable sector is used to generate hydrogen, uh, the rocks will not be paid? Because it's important that, 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 it, that there is an incentive to produce uh, hydrogen uh, for transport in the future, uh, and then also to ensure that energy uh, is not simply spilled when it's not needed, but it is captured. Um, I mean, in terms of electricity being used to produce hydrogen, the rocks are for the production of the electricity. What it's used for is, you know, it can be used by any industry to produce 
you know, for, for, for whatever use. Um, I, again, anyone can step in and correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, and, you know, in, in, in terms of billing electricity, again, I, given that you, 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 you get a price for your electricity, the rocks are essentially a top up on that. I, I don't understand what incentive there would be to. <laughs> To, to do that, so, um, you know, there, there's, there's, I mean, if, if there's too much electricity. So I've heard in the past that uh, the, the electricity cannot go into the grid because there's too much wind, perhaps. Yeah, I think, I think Stephen, I'll just jump in. I, I think maybe your question is, is on curtailment. So there is points where there, the system is unable to accommodate all the wind being generated, uh, and there is a, a periods of curtailment where, where some of the turbines are, are, are turned off, and that's obviously a, you know, a, a poor use of economic resource. Um, you know, this isn't a small-scale wind issue. This is you know, all, all generating in, in all jurisdictions. Um, there is you know, opportunity potentially to find ways of utilizing uh, that, that wind potentially through energy storage, potentially through hydrogen. Um, you know, they're, they're both emerging technologies, um, but, you know, I, I think we would hope that during the development of the Northern Ireland Energy Strategy uh, that's under consultation, you know, areas of utilising all our resources are, are used and, and maximised. Okay. Uh, Mr Boylan. Thank you, Chair. And, uh, Stephen, you're very welcome. Um, Served the committee back in, back in the day. Um, just one question, really, in terms of, and you've alluded to this, maybe you have answered an old in, in relation to actually qualifying your own figures and your own baseline in terms of data that the audit office hasn't got or hadn't got at the time, how, how do you qualify that or what's your measure or your baseline in, in terms of all the data that you have out there, even even there, the situation there where the chair asked about the number of jobs? Because, you know, in the past in, in committee, we were asked these, so, these certain types of questions. So I just wanted to ask that, how do you qualify those? Sure. So the, the jobs figure is ONS data, Office of National Statistics. So again, it's publicly available data. Um, and and I, I suppose I quote it, some, some in the industry would say it's an underestimate, but it, it's an official independent figure. So it, it, it's the one I use. Again, on the, the, the use of the data by KPMG, I'll hand over to Russell. Yeah, like I, I think you know we've 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 hopefully tried to tried during the session to to give uh, uh, you know evidence and examples of where the information has come from. You know, as we said, you know all our data sources are outlined in the report. The main one we said was if it's in the public domain, we will use official public domain data such as actual amount of energy produced um, and, and and everything else. We use multiple layers of of, uh, of protection and and um, verification to to ensure it's as robust as possible. Um, I'm not sure if there's any more details specifically um, I can add. No, Ross, I mean, clearly that's benched against other areas or we're operating maybe be it England, Scotland or Wales or whatever, is it? Is that how you bench it, yeah? Well, certainly one of our benchmarks we used was studies commissioned by the UK government on small-scale wind and GB. So we certainly benchmarked our data uh, against uh, data available um, from, from those GB studies. So yeah, we like we used as many data points as possible to verify, um, which included yeah, you know, certainly GB data as well. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Okay, um, Miss Flynn, do you want to come back in? Oh no, sorry, Chair, I didn't realise I didn't lower my hand. That's sorry okay. about that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, as far as I'm aware, that's all members who signalled they wanted to ask questions who've been facilitated, yes. Um, Mr Donnelly and Mr Stevenson, do you have any questions you want to ask? Uh, no, no questions. Okay, yeah. Mr Stevenson? Nothing from me, Chair. That's okay. the thank you. So at this stage, I'd like to thank Mr Agnew, Mr Thompson and Mr Smith for attending the meeting today on a very long session. And thank you for your answers. Um, Mr Agnew, do you and your colleagues wish to remain for this session? Um, in terms of uh, the session we're about to have, I, I would certainly like to, to stay on. Sure, I'm not sure if my my colleagues can. I think we're, we've run a bit later than maybe expected. Okay. But, uh, well, I'll, well, in that case, in that case, I thank Mr. Thompson and Mr. Smith and wish them a good afternoon. Broadcasting, can I ask you to please bring in Professor Hughes to the meeting? Um, Professor Hughes, can you see and hear us? Okay. What? Yes, I can hear you. I'm not sure whether you can see me. We, we can both see and hear you. Good afternoon. You're very welcome. Thank you. um, so, members, moving on to agenda item eight is the inquiry into generating electricity from renewable energy uh, evidence session two. 
Um, members, we will now hear evidence from, from Professor Hughes from Edinburgh University, who has written a paper on renewable energy entitled Small Wind Generation in Northern Ireland, pages 193 to 207 in your packs. Uh, Professor Hughes, welcome to the meeting, as I have said, and I would now invite you to make an opening statement, and then we will open the meeting up to the committee members for questions. Um, I will be very brief. I would like to say a word about my background. I have spent nearly 30 years working on renewable energy, both as an academic and as a policy advisor um, at the World Bank, and then work that I have done in various ways um, in the United Kingdom as well. Quite a lot of what I have to say in my paper is referenced back to a much bigger study that I carried out for the costs of wind generation in the United Kingdom, where I put together a large data set based on company accounts, and then I analysed that. And that includes small wind operations as well as larger wind farms right the way up in size to the very large offshore wind farms. The second thing I think that is important to emphasize in this context is that I have focused on the comparison in value for money terms between the subsidies that have been provided for small wind turbines, those up to 250 kilowatts, and those which are provided for uh, larger wind farms um, or wind turbines, which vary from one rock to 0.9 rocks um, over the period under consideration. Um, when I suggest that the costs of the small wind turbine program are high, that is because the same increase in renewable energy output was achievable and was largely achieved by the investments that took place in larger wind turbines and in larger wind farms. Um, when there is reference to the increase from roughly 3% to 49%, the majority of that increase occurred with subsidies at a much lower level than that were offered to small wind turbines. And therefore, in thinking about value for money, we need to focus on the issue of comparison rather than talking about the larger scale progress in renewable energy production in Northern Ireland. Um, I think with that, I would hand back to the chairman and invite any questions. Okay. Um, members, any questions? Mr. O'Toole. Thank you, um, Professor Hughes. You, um, when, when it comes to the, you, you basically talk, you, what you're talking about is the relative generosity or scale of subsidy in Northern Ireland um, versus um, the rest of the UK, where um, uh, a similar increase in renewable share of um, generation of the size of renewable generation was achieved with smaller subsidy. Um, what calculation have you made of the um, the excess uh, subsidy? As in, what how much less do you think you said Northern Ireland could have got there effectively, or could have got there or thereabouts with much less subsidy? How much less subsidy? Uh, well, the, the situation was that the original target was to achieve 40 per cent um, generation from renewable sources uh, by 2020. That was achieved, and that would have been achieved even if there had been no investment in small wind turbines, that is, less than 250 kilowatts. In Northern Ireland, the support scheme for wind turbines that are greater than 250 kilowatts or wind farms greater than that um, is exactly the same as was the case in the rest of the United Kingdom, at least under the renewables obligation. Under the FIT scheme, when it was introduced, 
the subsidies were at the beginning of the FIT scheme comparable in magnitude to what was offered by rocks and there was no excess but as time went on and as the changes were made to the way the FIT scheme worked in the rest of the United Kingdom the consequence was that Northern Ireland was essentially out of line with the rest of the United Kingdom and that promoted what was in effect an investment boom and the big investments in small turbines occurred in the period when they were much more generous under the narrow scheme than under the fit scheme and for those investments I estimate that the average excess subsidy was approximately um, £82,000 per year per turbine, which over all of the turbines amounts to about £43 million per year. That, I think, is what you wanted to know. But if I haven't yeah. been clear, please come back. No, that's great. You've been very clear. Um, on the... Um FIT versus the Nairo, we have heard, albeit um, not, in, it hasn't been entirely clearly articulated by the department, but we have heard that one potential explanation for the, for, well, <coughs> perhaps I'm, I'm better putting it, one potential explanation for the way, one potential factor, but it hasn't been consistently articulated, is that rural development writ large, particularly in smaller scale farms, perhaps it's fair to say the type of agricultural um, economic unit that exists on the island of Ireland but doesn't so much exist on Great Britain. Um, is that something you're aware of or in your study of the relative merits of um, uh, the GB approach and the Northern Ireland approach, have you come across any explanation, um, uh, have you come across um, <laughs> the rural development as an additional um, uh, motivation as well as simply increasing the amount of renewables? I have certainly heard it suggested that the scheme was retained as generously as it was in part because it provided certain kinds of benefits for small farmers of the kind that you have referred to. Um, the problem is that if it is intended as a rural support programme, then surely it ought to be compared with other potential rural support programmes in terms of <coughs> what is achieved and in terms of the effectiveness and the value for money given. Um, it was or has been consistently argued that both the FIT scheme and the narrow scheme were about generating low carbon electricity. Mm -hmm. And if you take that at face value, then the calculations that I give, I think, are relevant. I think if we were to try and say that, oh, well, it was both one and the other, we'd have to be a bit more explicit about what the potential amount of money that the Northern Ireland government was prepared to spend on rural development of this kind. And I think it also has to be remembered that the majority of the costs of narrow are not borne by the Northern Ireland population. They're borne by um, consumers, electricity consumers in the rest of the United Kingdom. And they might have something to say about their electricity bills being higher for the purpose of providing rural small farm support in Northern <laughs> Ireland. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Professor, you just, you've just used the term, you've heard it suggested um, in terms of small farms, etc. <laughs> Do you believe that to be the case? I have no basis for knowing whether it is the case or not. I think it is believed by a number of people um, whom I have met when I've given talks um, in Northern yeah, Ireland yeah. Um, in the past. Um, but I, I'm only reporting their belief. I cannot say whether that belief is correct or not. OK, I think it's important to clarify that point. Mr Hildage. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Professor Hughes, uh, do you consider de to be an acceptable practice 
for maximising the environmental benefit of the scheme? Um, I don't think derating of turbines is driven by maximising the environmental benefits. It's driven by the very sharp drop in the number of rocks and therefore the level of subsidy that is provided for output once you get above a rated capacity of 250 kilowatts. Mm -hmm. So the way to optimise the generation that you can obtain from a site on the basis that you are not going to go above 250 kilowatt capacity is to get the biggest turbine that you can find at a reasonable price, which is capable of generating more in low and medium wind conditions. Most turbines don't operate at full capacity for most of the time because the wind speeds are not high enough. Typically, wind speeds need to get to around 12 meters a second to generate at capacity. However, for a derated turbine, you can produce at the 250 kilowatt capacity at say seven or eight meters per second. And that greatly increases the amount of overall generation that you get from the turbine subject to the never going above 250 kilowatts. And that's really what the game is about. The game is about maximizing the production while maintaining the maximum level of subsidy support. Okay, thank you. And, and you've generated different figures for installation and operating cost of wind turbines. How, have you ever had these challenged or endorsed independently? Um, the, the costs of the capital costs of the turbines are taken from company accounts. What I did was that I examined the company accounts for a large number of special purpose companies that operate one or more wind turbines in Northern Ireland and which don't operate outside Northern Ireland. Um, that gave me the capital costs for the registered turbines under the narrow scheme. Um, and the number that I have is about double the size of the sample that KPMG have analyzed. The operating cost numbers come from a, the much bigger study that I referred to earlier, where I looked at in excess of 350 wind farms spread over Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales, England, um, of varying sizes from um, quite small to uh, very large. And I then did an analysis of the operating costs again extracted from company accounts with data taken for up to 15 years. And then I did two things. One, I analyzed those costs as a function of the location and the size of the wind farms. And there is a considerable clear relationship with both location and size so that the numbers that I've used are based on Northern Ireland and for small turbines. And then secondly, I analyzed what happened over time to costs. And one of the things that you may not be surprised to find is that there's quite a strong increase in operating costs over time. In other words, they're lower in their early years of operation and they're higher as um, the wind turbines age. Now that matters a lot in terms of KPMG's type of calculation, because if the costs are low to begin with, but high in later years, you actually get a significantly increased rate of return when you take account of that, than if you use the average over the full life of the turbines. So in effect, what's happened is that the KPMG figures reflect an average which are treated as applying every year, where actually what happens is they're relatively low in years one, two, three, but much higher in years 15, 16, 17 onwards. Um, in terms of validation, 
Um, these are public domain figures. They're figures that you can extract from the uh, company's house uh, accounts that are submitted by companies which specialize. I mean, these are special purpose vehicles. They are ones that operate only one wind farm or in a few cases, multiple wind farms. Okay, thank you. That's very useful. Okay, thank you. Mr. Muir, you did have your hand up. It's now been taken down. Are you okay? Okay, um, Mr. Beggs. Um, again, thanks, thanks for your evidence. Um, so I'm just trying to submit what I, or what I think you've said. Have you said your cost estimates and capital estimates are actually based on actual company accounts, the figures that are actually in special companies that are only set up for running a, a turbine? So they're not something that's been uh, invented. These are actual figures. Is that correct? Yes. These these are audited accounts. Well, it, um, for small companies, they're not strictly audited, but they are prepared <coughs> for by accountants like KPMG and others. So they reflect what the uh, accountants for these companies have recorded as being the capital costs and the operating costs for either wind farms or for individual wind turbines. And, and, and in your paper, you, you've talked about um, uh, a range of factors, the load factor, the, the average capital costs and the, the operating costs. Um, so so the, 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 the three different assumptions that you have put together um, seem to be saying that payback is after 4.8 years. So uh, that means there's considerable profit uh, from years 6 to 15, or for the further 15 years. Um, what, is, what is your estimate of that excess profit during that period? Well, can I take one step back and give a little bit of an explanation? Um, it is my view that in straightforward mathematical terms, KPMG have made a element, an elementary but important uh, mathematical error. What they've done is that they have treated the, pay, the internal rate of return or the payback period that is derived when you use average values for capital costs, for operating costs, and all of the other parameters as being the same as the average payback period or internal rate of return that you calculate for each of the individual uh, wind turbines or wind farms um, over uh, a sample, whether it be their sample or my bigger sample. That is simply wrong. That is not the case in the circumstances which characterize this data. And there are two important features about that. One, these distributions are very skewed. They, there are some very high cost um, developments. They have high capital costs, and that pushes up the average of the capital costs that is calculated by KPMG. They also have some firms which have very high operating costs because they've had major repair bills or whatever. Again, that pushes up the average. And then finally, they've taken an average load factor, which is well below the typical load factor that is quite, uh, achieved by the kind of um, developments in the period around well, from 2014 to 2017. Now, all of, what all of that means is that the figures that are presented by KPMG are not representative of the typical wind turbine in Northern Ireland. And that is why you get this much more profitable profile coming out of looking at the details and examining each of the wind turbines individually and calculating the payback periods, or well, the same would have been if I had used the internal rates of return. And as I've said earlier in reply, I think it was to Mr. Muir, um, the 
costs of the um, excess subsidies, in other words, the difference between regular wind farms and these small turbines is of the order of £82,000 a year for a wind turbine. And bear in mind that that's for a wind turbine which has cost, according to whether it's KPMG's figures or my figures, which has cost somewhere between four hundred and six hundred thousand pounds. So eighty thousand pounds a year is a pretty large return on that upfront capital cost. Uh, just a final question, then, in terms of, the, of examining these specialist companies, um, I have heard that uh, uh, hedge funds have been backing some of, some of the, the, the projects here. Um, so in, in examining those accounts, did you detect high uh, interest rates uh, as being a high cost item? And uh, just would be curious as to whether the, the addresses of the, the companies tended to be in Northern Ireland or indeed perhaps in London. Um, I, I, I did look at the addresses of the investors. There are a few um, standard sort of funds that I'm very conscious operate large numbers of turbines um, around uh, the UK in generally. Um, these are typically green investment funds. Um, there is a particular group, the Octopus Group, which has got large investments in both wind and solar spread around the UK, and they certainly have investments in a number of these uh, special purpose vehicles. Um, this is not typically reflected in where the companies are registered. They're typically registered in Northern Ireland, but it comes when you look at who the controlling shareholders are in terms of that. Uh, the other thing is that um, if you look at the balance sheets um, for those that report these details, um, uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland, actually the Ulster Bank, um, and some of its vehicles um, appears very, very regularly as a lender to um, these kind of projects. Now, that may be perfectly reasonable. They have a big business in Northern Ireland, um, but it's quite clear that there is, or there was a period when there was a little bit of what I might call a cookie cutter approach to these developments. In other words, you found a site, um, you put together a package, uh, you found a grid connection and you put up the turbine up with loans provided by um, particular lenders and perhaps then you sold on the project after um, it was developed and after it was registered for the narrow scheme. Uh, you might have sold it on um, essentially as a source of income generation for pension fund or for investors who are investing widely in green investments of various kinds. And, and was there an excessive uh, interest repayment costs associated with these companies? That, that's extremely hard to identify in these cases. I have come across that quite frequently in the case of larger companies. The reason why it's difficult to identify in the case of uh, the Northern Ireland <coughs> companies is that most of them qualify for what is known as the micro company exemption, which enables them to file a restricted set of accounts, which consists primarily of a balance sheet rather than a full income and um, expenditure uh, set of accounts. Okay, thank you. Okay. Very thank you very much. I think all members who think that they want to ask questions have asked questions. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Um, Mr. Hugh, do you have any questions you want to ask? Sorry, Joe, I was just um, getting myself off mute. Um, I suppose it's hard for us. I, I, the one question I'd ask is, is Professor Hughes um, content for his uh, report to be published? Um, he's seen sight of our, our report in advance, um, and, and we haven't had that equal opportunity. So, uh, I mean, certainly on, on some of the things he says in, in the first instance, for example, in terms of the load factor, um, every single turbine, the, the average was across every single turbine in the small scale cap. Uh, category, 
in the KPMG report. So it, it's, I mean, that can be checked. It, it's, it's a fairly simple calculation of data that's in the public domain. It's 22% for the range identified in the report and um, between 100 kilowatts to to 250 kilowatts. So that, that that's just fact. It's just basic calculation. Um, and, and I don't think it's open to challenge. Um, there is a reference of data of 15 years. Um, I, I, I didn't get the exact detail, but um, most of the turbines in question have only been operating for five years. So you can't get 15 years worth of data out of, out of, out of five years. Um, so I, I, I think it, it's hard to fully respond without seeing um, Professor Hughes's report, but um, the KPMG report is in the public domain for anyone to to check the methodology. Um, and I, I contend that it's sound. Um, and, uh, you know, but as I say, we'd, I, we'd appreciate it if, if perhaps Professor Hughes is content um, for the report to be shared with us and, and we can put our comments in writing to the committee. <coughs> Those are any points you would make? I don't want to keep going back and forth. Is there the only point you would make? Yes. Um, I, I sort of, yeah, as say, with, with, without having had the time to properly consider the, the professor's report, okay. it's hard to, to give accurate. But as I say, I, I stand over the KPMG findings to suggest they've made a, 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 what was a, called an elementary mistake. Um, I, I, I put my money on the reputation of KPMG personally. Okay, thank you. Um, Professor Hughes, um, did you hear Mr Agnew okay and do you want to respond to the two points he raises, i.e. publishing your report and the 15 years as compared to the five years in terms of data? Uh, I mean, the simple answer is I'm more than happy for the report to be published. Um, when we discussed this um, and when I prepared this, uh, we had intended that um, and I expected, in fact, that this would be published as part of the evidence that is received by the committee. Um, I apologise to Renewable Northern Ireland. Um, I didn't realise they hadn't seen it. Um, I would assumed it might be passed on to them. But um, we have absolutely no problem um, actually having it published. Um, and it was my intention that it would be published on the uh, via the web pages of the Renewable Energy Foundation, which is a charity for which I've prepared a number of reports and for which the figures that I've reported about the operating cost, where Mr. Agnew questions the issue of five to 15 years, the full details of that are in a quite lengthy report um, on wind power economics, which can be obtained from um, the website of the Renewable Energy Foundation. Um, concretely on that, what I explained was that we, I had compiled a large sample of more than 350 uh, wind farms um, around the United Kingdom, which have been operating since 2000. So there is indeed 15 years or more of data that is available on the operating costs um, of some of those wind farms. Of course, the newest ones that you're talking about have not been operating for as long as 15 years, but unless one believes that operating costs are fundamentally different um, in Northern Ireland um, from in other parts of the United Kingdom for the same size and nature of the wind turbines, um, the results are entirely transferable to the small wind turbine sector in Northern Ireland. Uh, and finally, could I also pick up on this issue of the load factor? Um, making a statement that the load factor for small turbines in Northern Ireland from 2010 to 2016 um, was 22% is actually not very helpful because that is for a relatively small sample of um, wind turbines, because very few were installed prior to 2016, and it's for a particular set of sites. And quite obviously, what has happened was that the wind farm 
developers um, who have installed these new turbines have chosen better sites, that is to say, with higher wind yields, and they have gone for derated or similar turbines, which always yield a higher load factor than the load factors if you have one that was originally built as 150 kilowatts or 250 kilowatt turbine. So you know, th th there, are, there are simple statistical and mathematical considerations which mean that you would not expect what has happened from 2016 to 2020 to be the same as the situation as it was from 2010 to 2016. Uh, and finally, let me point out that my professional background and expertise is as a statistician. Um, I'm afraid I don't accept that it is likely that KPMG are more right, uh, more likely to be right than I am. <laughs> Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. O'Toole, I think you would like to come in. Um, a, a very brief question. Professor Hughes, would it be fair to say that, I mean, the renew you mentioned the, the, um, the Renewable Foundation, the Renewable uh, Energy Foundation. Would it be fair to say the Renewable Energy Foundation is viewed as a sort of fundamentally sceptical organisation when it comes to wind power in general? Um, I had thought about commenting on that um, in my opening statement. I think that is an exercise in name calling. Um, I have sorry, done, an exercise. We you, you broke up there. An exercise in what? Name calling. Okay. Okay. I, I think I think the situation is that the major amount of work that we do at the Renewable Energy Foundation is the collection and publication of statistics. Um, if we are regarded as a sceptical organisation, then that's because I have written several papers which demonstrate that the economics of renewable energy are a wee bit more complicated than the rather oversimplified version that we get from um, those people who are very strongly in favour of uh, renewable energy. Um, to point out that everything isn't always rosy is not being sceptical. Well, it's being sceptical, but it's not being in any sense out of line with a proper and reasonable appraisal of the economics of a sector which receives very large amounts of subsidies. Can I just ask one very brief question? For do you think that the UK government targets, indeed, for that matter, whether EU targets, US government targets for uh, renewables as a share of electricity generation, do you agree with those as uh, reasonable targets? Not the specific ones, but the idea of setting targets for renewable generation as part of decarbonisation? I said at the beginning that my concern was with value for money. That is to say, is the cost of the reductions in carbon dioxide um, good value for money for those who have to pay, whether it be the taxpayers or whether it be the people who um, have to pay their electricity bills? My own preference is that setting targets is, a, from an economist's point of view, a less efficient way of achieving the goals of reducing carbon emissions at low cost is a less efficient way of doing it than having a clear system of incentives and rewards. Um, and a system of incentives and rewards that is roughly the same across types of renewable energy and other activities which are capable of reducing carbon emissions. So, in purely technical terms, I am strongly in favour of having carbon taxes and pricing carbon properly. I think setting specific targets for renewable energy um, produces um, unintended consequences and often produces the kind of consequences that we're focusing on here, which is of having a number of policies which turn out to save carbon, but at very high prices. Um, okay, thank you. Can I, can I just clarify a couple of points, Professor, if you don't mind? Um, 
When will the, your report be placed on the Renewable Energy Foundation website? Have you any um, idea? Uh, it, was, it was our... We felt that we ought to give first sight of it to the committee. Okay. Um, I think um, if we have your agreement, um, we will put it up tomorrow or the day after. Oh, absolutely. It's your, it's your, um, it's your academic property, so uh, th we have no difficulty with that. Uh, are you content? If the, the clerk has confirmed to me that she does have a copy of your report. Are you content that we pass that to Renewables NI? Are you content with that? I'm entirely happy okay. that you do that. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not aware that any other member has any other questions. Um, Mr. Donnelly, Controller and Order General, have you any questions? Uh, no. It's, okay. Um, uh, Mr. Stevenson from the TOA, have you any questions? for? Mr. No questions from me, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Well, with, with that then, can I thank um, Professor Hughes and Mr. Agnew for their attendance this afternoon? Um, a very useful session and um, wish you a very good afternoon. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Chair. Okay, broadcasting, Mr. Ingrid, Mr. Thompson, Smith, okay. Professor Hughes, and Mr. Stevens will now leave the meeting. Um, members, we will go into closed session uh, with the two evidence sessions uh, um, to discuss the two evidence sessions with the Audit Office. And broadcasting, can you bring in Mr. Brian O'Neill from the Audit Office? Uh, Mr. Bingham, can you still see and hear us okay? Yes, sir, I can. Okay, members, we will now go into closed session. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is